many familiar faces and some new faces that I haven't seen before, but I guess that's kind of the nature of this, is every time I feel like we've gotten somebody on place, it's like, hey, I'm brand new. Um, Luckily, that's not me anymore. Uh, So I have some answers for you. I don't have a lot. If you came here expecting, like, a lot of information on WIOA, sorry to disappoint. Um, I would love some more information on WIOA. But I will give you what I've got, and then um, I left plenty of time for questions. Um, So if you guys have any questions, definitely I want to make sure I address those. Just a reminder um, for the data reporting requirements specific to the PHI caps. Uh, we're going to be looking for those institutions that have actually been able to implement um, the Phi Caps program or not just planning it, but actually have enrollment. We'll be reporting with specific course numbers. This will al- enable us to delineate who is a Phi Caps person versus a non Phi Caps person. We definitely want to do some um, data analysis, um, looking at doing some longitudinal kind of studies as we progress through this program to see how these students do in comparison with students who are not enrolled in these programs. And so that was where we came up with individual course numbers. So for districts, um, if you are already enrolling or if you are planning to enroll, um, please make sure that you're enrolling them with the um, specific JEDI course number of 9900136. These students may still be enrolled in ABE because the requirement to be in JEDI is that they had to be in the um, working at the ninth grade level in at least two of the subject areas, but they could still be in GED, uh, in ABE or ESOL for one of those. Students reported in this course are expected to be concurrently enrolled in a post-secondary program. Um, so in an ideal world, we would be able to match against post-secondary institutions to see these students. Um, I think that's something that we're still going to have to sort of figure out the mechanism for, particularly if the district is handling the AGE enrollment and the college is handling the post-secondary enrollment. For colleges, uh, we did have to create a nomenclature for you guys to report under because you guys report your courses in a different way. So the expectation is that you would be using the GEX 0100 to GEX 0199 course numbering system to um, identify which students are phi caps. Same requirements as districts in terms of who should be the threshold to be in those. Um, as you know, fall enrollment is currently open, and so we're hoping that we start to see some of these preliminary enrollments. I was hoping to have some, some fall enrollment data um, from those reports, but the low date is not until next week, and um, I'm sure most of you know that we don't really get a lot of good information prior to low date. We don't even sometimes get really good information after low date. Uh, but I would encourage you, how many of you are your reports coordinator for your district or college? How many of you know who your reports coordinator is? Okay, not as many hands as I'd like to see. Um, if you don't know who your reports coordinator is, they are your best friend, particularly on the district side, because on the district side, we um, make available a slew of reports after each reporting window. So after the load date next Friday, Bruce will be busy producing a bunch of reports that'll be posted out there on the Secure SharePoint site. Some of those reports um, have enrollment by course, and those are the ones that I would suggest that you review if you think you should have JEDI enrollment. That'll very quickly tell you whether or not that enrollment made it through. Um, Some other key data reporting requirements or collection um, is, of course, as you all know, the tuition and fees of AGE, which is the 30 per term or 45 per half year, and, of course, the post-secondary clock hour tuition rate, whatever your institution set that rate at. Um, and then, unfortunately, of course, the residency requirement if it is post-secondary. Uh, scheduling for these students should not overlap. We definitely want to encourage you to be very creative in in the design of your programs, but you still have to work within the parameters of data reporting. So just make sure that you're being very clear about what is an AGE hour versus a PSAV hour so that they can be reported appropriately. We strongly recommend that you use the implementation time to really plan out what this is going to look like. It sounds like you guys are all moving slow but steady, which is the perfect way to go, um, to get an idea of what will this look like on a shared basis, particularly when you're dealing with cost reporting codes for districts, because they have to be reported with different cost reporting codes. Um, so that is something addition, an additional layer to think um, of when you're doing the data. Some of the questions that we've gotten 
So, um, and these are not necessarily specific to Jedi, but we've gotten them in the context of these Jedi programs. What happens if a student passes the GED? Well, the answer is, is that they're no longer a Jedi student. Um, they're just simply a CTE student. There's no reason to keep them enrolled in a Jedi course because they don't need GED preparation any longer. Um, if you have a student that still has a basic skills requirement that they haven't met, the appropriate placement for that student is now triple AE. Um, and, and that is an AGE program that's not part of NRS. So it's a state-supported program. It's not part of your NRS. But that would be the appropriate place to transition that student into if they still had a basic skills requirement but had a GED. Um, this will be particularly relevant given the information on the webinar on Tuesday. How many of you were able to listen in on the webinar on Tuesday afternoon? How many of you have at least gotten to hear the news that was shared at the webinar on Tuesday? Okay. Um, there is an FAQ on the, the GED page at the Florida Department of Education related to the, the changing of the PASS score for the GED. Um, so please definitely take a look at that FAQ because it, it talks about the intersection between the change at the national level and the requirements at the state level and what that process is going to entail. All right, so what happens if a student decides not to continue enrollment in the CTE program? They just decide that that's not for them, they don't have the schedule for those. Well, in those cases, those students would just be transitioned, exited out of the JEDI course, and transitioned into the regular GED course if that's something that they chose to do. But we don't want to continue to include them in our GED cohort because, uh, or the JEDI cohort, because that would uh, mean that we were looking for that concurrent enrollment. Reporting of industry certifications with the JEDI course number. Um, it sounds like in some cases, in the conversations that have been going on, you guys are really looking in some instances for um, specific industry cer certificate or certification programs, not necessarily CTE programs per se, although we like to say a lot of our CTE programs embed what you need to earn in industry certifications. In this case, it's important to remember that industry certifications cannot be reported with the JEDI course. We don't allow industry certification activity to be reported with adult ed courses. They are only reportable with the concurrent CTE program course. So I did a quick survey, and I apologize that it's not very easy to see, and I didn't print ahead of time because I didn't have this done until... Wednesday, um, but uh, I just wanted to give you guys sort of an idea of where everybody was at in case you're wondering, for those that did receive the FICAPS grant, um, who, who was able to do implementation versus enrollment. Um, of the, we have um, three colleges and we have five districts that received the grant. Um, of those, we had two of the colleges and three of the districts who were able to get enrollment started for this winter spring or anticipate having enrollment by the end of the spring. Um, and we have three agencies, a, a college and, a di and two districts that are still just in the implementation phase and don't expect to show enrollment in any of the FICAPS programs. In terms of anticipated enrollment, I kind of wanted to get a sense of what does the JEDI program look like in comparison to the traditional GED program. As you can see, um, we still have um, very small numbers in FICAPS or JEDI versus the traditional GED program. Um, but we do have growth. We did see a lot of change between the fall and the winter, which we expected to see. We're very excited to see where the next year brings us with this as you guys really um, work out how to recruit these students, what that model looks like, and those internal conversations. I also wanted to just shed some light on why this is so critical. Um, and why at the state level we have such a vested interest and why locally you have such a vested interest. Sometimes numbers speak volumes, and I think this speaks a lot of volumes. So what we have here is your 14, 15. This is students who were enrolled in a GED preparation program in 2014, 15, as reported by your institutions. So you can see districts, we had about 18,000 in a GED preparation program. Colleges, we had about 5,400. Of, dis of those 18,000 at the district, only 
were shown taking one subtest during the reporting year. So we looked during that current year, do we have a subtest for that student? 19% had all subtests. And we went back to the original series. So if they did one subtest the prior year and did three the current year, that's when they were found as a completer. So they had at least one subtest in the current year, and they showed all subtests. Now, for those who completed, districts had about a 70% completion, uh, pass rate of GED earners. But we're losing a lot of students on the pipeline. So even though the pass rate looks good, there's a whole gap between those that never even could show up in the pass rate because they haven't even taken all four subtests. Um, colleges, we had an even lower percentage of students who were completers, meaning that they showed up taking all four subtests. Now, I'm not sure how this data is going to change with the new pass rates and what that impact will look like, uh, but I do think that this raises some concerns because we want to make sure that our students are being successful. So that is why programs like the Bridge programs or the FICAPS program, we think are really good models. I'm just curious to see how the data ends up backing it up in the end um, of how those students progress if they're more engaged. That's really all that I brought for you guys. I wanted to leave room for questions. Tara, we have a question here. Okay. With 100% overlap, would you then put 50% Um, if you genuinely believe that 50% of the instruction occurring is preparation for the GED, then yes. Um, if you believe that it's more geared towards GED preparation, then I would adjust to report whatever that is. That's why you really have to go into it very deliberately. Um, what we don't want is we don't want CTE activity being reported as GED. Um, the contextualized is one thing, but true CTE um, instruction should be reported as CTE. Um, a lot of it is driven off of the instructional hours that students are paying for on the CTE side of things. That really is a big dictator of what hours you're reporting for instructional hours for CTE. No, sorry. Um, as soon as you get notice that the student has passed the GED, that becomes their exit from the JEDI course number, um, and then they're considered to be just a CTE student at that point. Any other questions? All right. You guys are just ready to go home. Thank you.